West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com These fake documents, these forged documents with, with fake electoral votes, this part of the plot has since emerged as a matter of potential criminal prosecution in at least two states and at the federal level. So, for example, on the, the first question here, was it illegal? And, and did the, the, the first question here, was it illegal? Did they know it was illegal? The January 6th investigators have given us a resounding yes on both of those. The January 6th investigators have shown testimony that not only did the White House Counsel's Office conclude that the fake electors plan was illegal, the White House Counsel's Office formally notified White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and Trump's lawyer Rudy Giuliani and all the other people who happened to be allowed into their meeting about it. The White House Counsel's Office told them outright at the White House that the fake electors thing was illegal. Even beyond them showing that just all the lawyers knew it was illegal, the investigation also showed that some of the people who participated, some of the people who signed their names on these forged documents, who signed up to be the fake electors, they asked, as they did so, for the Trump campaign to please agree in advance to play their to, to pay their legal fees in case they were sued or arrested for trying to pull this off. Next crucial question. Did they try to pull it off anyway? Of course they tried to pull it off anyway. They did, in fact, forge fake Electoral College slates of votes. They mailed them into the National Archives as if they were real, hoping they'd be counted as if they were real. So was it illegal? Yes. Did they know it was illegal? Yes. Did they try to pull it off anyway? Yes. Was it occasionally hilarious when they did so? Yes. He told me um, that the... Michigan Republican electors were planning to meet in the Capitol and hide overnight so that they could fulfill the role of casting their vote in per law in the Michigan uh, uh, chambers. And um, I told him in no uncertain terms that that was insane and inappropriate plotting to sneak into the Capitol the night before and hide out overnight, like in cupboards or something, so they could pop out and surprise everybody at the right moment and say, Neener, Neener, we have beaten the real electors to the punch, and so now we're the real electors or something. Like, as if that's how presidents are chosen. We also know that there was this. Um, this is a text message exchange showed by the January 6th investigators. Vice President Pence's staffer are the little bubbles on the right. Uh, you see the first one starting the conversation there from that staffer. Sup, as in what's up. And then on the left side, you see bubbles there from a staffer, chief of staff to Senator Ron Johnson. Senator Ron Johnson staffer says, Johnson needs to hand something to the vice president. Please advise. Vice president staffer responds, what is it? Senator Ron Johnson's chief of staff responds, 
alternate slate of electors for Michigan and Wisconsin because archivists didn't receive them. The vice president staffer says in response, do not give that to him. This was just min these are all time stamped, right? So you can see this is January 6th in the noon hour. This was just minutes before Vice President Pence was supposed to actually count the Electoral College votes, which is actually how we count the votes for president in this country. Hey, uh, Senator Johnson needs to hand the vice president two of these forged fake elector certificates before the counting starts. Uh, how do we do that? What? Also, why was Senator Ron Johnson volunteering to do that? Why was he even involved? How much did you know about what your chief of staff was doing with the alternate slates of electors? No, you're not. I can see your phone. I can see your screen. Can you explain what your chief of staff was doing? Does your chief of staff still work for you, Senator? Can you explain what happened there? Why was your chief of staff even offering this to the vice president? It's a complete non-story. We just used a statement. And it's a non-story. I, I don't know what you're, what you're even concerned about. Well, they said that Did you were, your chief of staff was saying that you offered, my, 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 you wanted to tell, no, provide no, no, the no, alternate no, electors of no, Michigan and Wisconsin this, this, to Vice President Mike Pence. This, this was a staff-to-staff -staff exchange, and I was you know, basically unaware of it. And the chief of staff contacted the vice president's staff. So do you want this? They said no, and, and we didn't deliver it, and that's the end of the story. But why was he even asking for that? Because somebody delivered this to our office and asked to deliver that to the vice president. Did you support the, his efforts to try to get those slates to the vice president? No, I, I, I had no knowledge of this. Who's, who's the person I, that I don't, I, you know, I, I had no involvement in an alternate state of, uh, slate of electors. I had no idea this thing would be delivered to us. Got delivered staff to staff. My chief staff did the right thing. Contact the vice president's staff. Uh, they said didn't want it, so we didn't deliver it. Who's the person? That's, again, that's the end of the story. I had no knowledge of this. I don't even know who gave this thing to us. I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't ask who it came from. I just volunteered that I would take this thing that I didn't know anything about, and I didn't know who it came from, and I didn't have anything to do with it, and I didn't even support it. But it was something, I don't know what, that needed to go to the vice president. And hey, I'm a senator. And that's one of the things we do. We hand deliver mail and packages to the vice president all the time. You know, sometimes it's catalogs and you can assume he probably doesn't want them, but maybe it's something that he really likes and he likes to go through those catalogs. Sometimes it looks important. I don't know. I'm just a mule. I also take out the recycling sometime and I do beer runs, whatever. I'm, you know, what else do senators do? Senator Ron Johnson, I'm on the phone. No, you're not, Senator. We can see that there is nothing happening on the screen of your phone. I'm just going to keep holding this to my face for a little while so you'll pretend that you didn't notice that I'm not on the phone and then I'll put it down without saying anything. But it also should be noted, this, this part of it, this line that we've highlighted here from the Senator's Chief of Staff, Senator Johnson needs to hand deliver these fake elector certificates to the Vice President because the archivist didn't receive them. Well, no. We know, in fact, that the archives did receive them. I mean, here they are, sent registered mail weeks earlier from Wisconsin and Michigan and received by the National Archives. These are the National Archives records. As Kyle Cheney at Politico was first to point out earlier today, we know that the National Archives received these. This was not some lost in the mail problem where Senator Ron Johnson had to sub in at the last second as the slowest leg ever on the Pony Express. I mean, the archivist had these. The archivist, in reality, is in charge of receiving the actual certified legal electoral votes from the states and then giving those real electoral votes to the vice president so he can count them on January 6th. The archivist did that. That is why Pence had the real certified electoral votes physically, hard copies of them, to count on January 6th. The archivist sent Mike Pence the real vote. The archivist just didn't also give Pence the junk mail, the illegal, counterfeit, not certified fake electoral slates too. Yes, they had them. We know that they had received them. They just didn't pass that junk onto the actual vice president for the actual counting of the real electoral votes. So what Senator Ron Johnson and his office were trying to arrange at the very last minute before Pence started counting the, started the count was to use this false claim. 
oh, hey, you know, we understand the vice president is supposed to have these, but for some reason, the archives didn't get them. But don't worry, Senator Ron Johnson can courier them over himself and hand deliver them. They were using this false claim about the archives to try to give the vice president forged fake votes in time for the count. Nice. Call your office, Senator. Maybe turn your phone on this time. So, was it illegal? Yes. Did they know it? Yes. Did they try it anyway? Sadly, yes. Was it occasionally hilarious when they did so? Of course it was. Next crucial question, did they get caught? Well, yes. Here's a federal judge ruling that Trump's lawyer, John Eastman, his communications on this matter, must be released to the January 6th investigation because those communications are evidence of a possible crime. Yes, they got caught. I mean, here's the January 6th investigation looking at this very closely, starting to reveal all their findings about it, including Trump campaign lawyers and people who worked on the scheme for the Trump campaign in multiple states saying, saying in their sworn depositions, yeah, it was illegal and they wish they'd never had anything to do with it. Here's that pained deposition they played excerpts from yesterday, a pained deposition from the head of the Republican Party, RNC chair Ronna Romney McDaniel. The RNC had previously denied to reporters that they had anything to do with this fake elector scheme. But hey, look, under oath, there's Ronna Romney McDaniel now admitting that, yes, actually, the RNC helped put the fake electors together and and that it was Trump personally, Trump himself former president himself, who called her personally and asked her to help with the fake electors scheme. So yes, they got caught, up to and including the president's personal involvement in it. And as much discussion as there has been about whether there will be criminal prosecutions for the plot to overthrow the government that has been exposed by the January 6th investigation, this part of it, this part of it is where we already know there are multiple federal and state criminal investigations underway. Uh, We've been able to report here on the show, including today, that multiple Georgia Republicans who were asked to participate in the fake elector scheme, but who chose not to for whatever reason, multiple Georgia Republicans in that position have been interviewed and or have testified before three different entities, the January 6th committee, the FBI, and also the criminal investigation being led by state prosecutors working out of Fulton County, Georgia. And now today, what is being described as a major escalation of the federal criminal investigation into these matters. The Washington Post was first to the story with this headline today. January 6th probe expands with fresh subpoenas in multiple states. Recipients of subpoenas include a state party chairman as officials probe deeper into pro-Trump efforts to use invalid electors to try to thwart Biden's 2020 victory. Um, illegal? Yes. They knew it? Yes. They tried it anyway? Yes. To hilarious effect? Yes, of course. But yes, they have been caught doing it with active criminal grand jury investigations at both the federal and state level. And the federal investigation today appears to have widely expanded. And that, of course, just leaves us with the last question. Does anybody actually end up getting in trouble here? It is Thursday. The 23rd of June of 2022. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Just a little bit. Okay, well, speaking of spicy, uh, the... Do we call him the F word on uh, on the Supreme Court, the conservative majority? Do do we use the F word for them? And I don't mean the one that starts with F and ends with an R. I mean the other F word, you know, the Italian one. Uh huh. <laughs> because I don't know. They seem very intent on destroying representative democracy in the name of originalism. Yeah, that's original. 
Boy, I got to tell you, when it, when I first heard the term originalism, I it, the, the idea that the founders had some sort of original thought and that's what we're supposed to uh, adhere to. No, the first thing that came to my mind is that these wacko conservos were coming up with some kind of original idea that's only peculiar to them. It is only peculiar. It is peculiar to them. So um, here we are. Women are going to lose a fundamental right of bodily autonomy. I read briefly here as I was getting ready to put myself in the bubble that uh, the court will take up the state election rights case about uh, is it lawmakers or the state courts that determine, you know, elections. So in other words, when the court says that a particular aspect of gerrymandering is unconstitutional, that's up to lawmakers to decide, right? The ones that are racially gerrymandering now. Okay, we were, I, you know, we warned people way, way back in the 80s. Federalist Society, Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Koch brothers, the Petersons, the DeVosses, the DuPonts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That uh, uh, something bad would come about from what was obvious at the time, though we weren't willing to use the F word because it was untoward. You don't use the F word here in America. That's for lazy intellectual people. Oh, you're lazy. You're intellectually lazy. Yeah, so we we couldn't call it what it was and is now. And yeah, they're fascists. There's no getting around it. I use Nazi for short. Some people will say, oh, you can't call them a Nazi because they're not fully automatic. Those are only semi-automatic Nazis. Well, you know, they're still Nazis. All right. I got you. In America, they're semi-automatic Nazis. It doesn't lessen the impact of their warlike behavior. Doesn't it? So... Uh, this is the other aspect of this whole scenario that cracks me up in a gallows humor sort of way. They are preparing for war in the streets because that's what they do. They don't get their way. They don't get a tax break. They're going to war in the streets. Jesus H. Christ. Trump got installed by a hostile foreign power and we had a women's march that you know the day after inauguration day millions there was no storming the capitol there was no beating the hell out of cops warring in the streets is what they do we vote and because of that, they're going to take that away, too. You don't have a right to an abortion. You don't have the right to birth control. And you do not have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Are the founders turning in their graves? No, they're dead. They're probably just absolutely right now at this point decomposed. Everything's been transferred to another energy source. They've become the ether. Literally. We're on our own, folks. And we got a bunch of idiots who think that they can interpret it, interpret biblical law. You know, I asked, I asked an idiot the other day to fill me in on the Council of Trent. They had no idea what I was talking about. And yet, I'm supposed to stand back and let them interpret biblical law. We have at least one, if not more, members of the, of the fascist wing of the Supreme Court who is a conspiracy-laden weirdo. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Sam. Warring in the streets. So let's defund the schools, too. Don't ever talk about police reform, because that's defunding the cops. 
But there's no problem with defunding schools because obviously those are hotbeds of democracy. Got to get rid of that. And we're going to stand back and say, oh, well, it would be untoward to call them what they are. They're fascist Nazis. Just go ahead. Nazis for short. They're doing the exact same thing right down to a long running night of the long knives. They kill their own. For daring uh, to maybe supplant them in the hierarchy of power. Not only want to get rid of all the rest of us, but they're watching their backs for members of their own side who want to stab in the in the back. Or just, you know, move up the hierarchy because they think that's the natural order of things. It's a death cult. It's a cult of violence. And it is a cult of hate. That's why I call them Nazis for short, because they codify it all. Oh, boy. Right down to inviting Brit documentarians to uh, record their coup. That is the height of hubris. And we're supposed to act nice to them. We're supposed to find some sort of comity. Here in Oregon, I've mentioned this before, we have an independent candidate for governor who's running on a platform that the extremists in Oregon are the reason that we don't have anything. We, we, we don't have really a government anymore because of the extremists, uh, you know, the Democratic extremists and the Republican extremists. And only Betsy can bring both of them to the table. Only one's going to show up and that'll be us. It'll be the same old, same old. The only thing extreme is by the fact that we haven't moved from re uh, Eisenhower Republican policies in this whole shift rightward of the GOP into fascism. We seem extreme as being Eisenhower Republican policyists because of how far to the fascist spectrum the Republican Party has fallen. Betsy's not bringing both parties to the table. All right. I, did I get that off my chest? Well, uh, maybe for today. Maybe. It's just really nice realizing that, you know, for, you know, for about 53 minutes now, we'll have, uh, you know, some actual constitutional freedoms. Only for about 53 minutes. All right. What do we have curated for you here in the Bistro Cafe as we begin this fine Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Yeah, Trump's fake elector scheme becomes more than just a scandal. It's now being charged as a crime. On the rest of the menu, the DOJ wants to know if Sidney Powell is funding the Oath Keeper's legal defense. Yeah, all of us would like to know that. A federal judge reluctantly postponed the trial of five members of the extremist group Proud Boys, but they will remain in pre-trial detention. Extremist group is a nice way of calling them brown shirts. I should have just put brown shirts there. And the owner of seven Louisiana nursing homes who sent more than 800 of his elderly residents to a crowded ill-equipped warehouse to ride out Hurricane Ida last year was arrested on fraud and cruelty charges. And it's about time. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Russia's chokehold over gas could send Europe back to coal. And the Australian state of Victoria has been the Nazi swastika amid a resurgence of far-right extremism all that and more on west coast cookbook and speakeasy bon appetit
the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link across the page near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And yes, would you please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio? If you could... Send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance. If those funds could come our way once a month, we're able to stretch those dollars beyond compare, pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue this powerhouse of resistance as we have been resisting for the last 11 years with your generosity. Thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. And thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. Incidentally, I also post the show notes and links diary. It will be a diary, not a story. I'm old school that way. Nonetheless, I post that diary 10 minutes before showtime. And then uh, you can mostly find the show notes and links linked up to that Daily Coast Diary on Twitter at Justice Putnam. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, wherever podcasts can be found. And as a reminder, the Deep State, <laughs> Deep State, the Deep Archive. Uh, it could be a deep state archive of the Netroots Radio Library for the past 11 years. It can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Washington Post by Rachel Weiner and Spencer S. Shue. The Justice Department is asking a federal judge to probe possible financial relationships between members of the Oath Keepers accused of trying to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president and a nonprofit entity run by Trump attorney Sidney Powell that spread false election claims. The government is protecting the record by involving the court in the process of addressing a potential conflict before it undermines a proceeding and a defendant's right to competent and conflict representation, prosecutors wrote yesterday, Wednesday. The unusual request follows media reports that Powell's nonprofit organization, Defending the Republic, has used some of the millions of dollars it has raised through spreading conspiracy theories about the 2020 election to pay legal fees for Oath Keeper members facing trial. According to BuzzFeed and Mother Jones articles cited in the filing, four defendants, including Stuart Rhodes, who founded the self-styled militia group, have taken funds from Powell's organization. All four are accused of obstructing Congress's counting of electoral college votes on January 6, 2021. Rhodes and two others are accused of engaging in a seditious conspiracy against the United States. U.S. prosecutors asked the trial judge to ensure, in private if necessary, that counsel is complying with the legal ethic ethics that bar outside funding for legal defense unless the client gives informed consent. The rules prohibit attorneys from sharing confidential client information with outsiders except under certain conditions. The government also is asking the judge to ensure that the involvement of Powell's group results in no interference with the lawyer's independence or with the client-lawyer relationship. Prosecutors expressed concern that defending the Republic was discouraging plea deals, saying that could be against the interest of a particular defendant. Four charged in the overlapping conspiracies have pleaded guilty and agreed to cooperate with the government. Several more, several more have pleaded guilty in related cases. Before making its filing, 
The Justice Department queried private lawyers representing 10 members of the Oath Keepers. According to the court record, attorneys for four of the defendants said they were not taking any money from defending the Republic. Attorneys for another three said they were in compliance with the rules, but would not say whether they took any money from Powell's group. And attorneys for two defendants did not respond. One declined, saying he would answer any questions asked by the judge. Offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays is also out of the Washington Post and also by Spencer S. Hsu. A federal judge on Wednesday yesterday postponed the trial of five members of the extremist group Proud Boys after several defendants and prosecutors warned that the planned release of a public report and witness transcripts from the high-profile January 6th Capitol attack could upend preparations. U.S. District Judge Timothy J. Kelly of Washington, D.C. said at a hearing he reluctantly reached the decision to delay the scheduled August 8th trial of former Proud Boys chairman Henry Enrique Tarrio and four others on seditious conspiracy and other charges, but acknowledged strong concerns from prosecutors and defense lawyers that the House Select Committee investigating the breach may divulge key evidence that they have not seen. The move to a trial now set for December came as televised House hearings this month that have focused in part on alleged actions by Proud Boy members amid what lawmakers say is potentially criminal behavior by Trump and others who falsely claimed the 2020 election was stolen before the attack on Congress. Of course, this is the Washington Post, so they have to say alleged. We saw it in real time, didn't we? The Proud Boys trial judge ruled after Justice Department senior officials warned a lawyer for the House panel last week that by not giving prosecutors access to about 1,000 transcripts of private witness interviews before their planned public release in September, lawmakers were complicating prosecutors' ability to investigate and prosecute those who engaged in criminal conduct or It could be holdovers embedded by the Trump administration in the Justice Department throwing another monkey wrench in the works. A pox on their house. Kevin McGill of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The owner of seven Louisiana nursing homes who sent more than 800 of his elderly residents to a crowded, ill-equipped warehouse to ride out Hurricane Ida last year was arrested yesterday, Wednesday, on fraud and cruelty charges arising from the squalid conditions. Bob Glenn Dean Jr., age 68, 
had already lost state licenses and federal funding for crowding his residents into a facility in the town of Independence, roughly 70 miles northwest of New Orleans. There, authorities said they found ill and elderly bedridden uh, people on mattresses on the wet floor, some crying for help, some lying in their own waste. Some had arrived without their medicine, according to one doctor. Civil suits against Dean's Corporation said the ceiling leaked, toilets overflowed at the sweltering warehouse, and there was too little food and water. Dean was in custody in Tangapau Parish, parish, (laughs) facing charges of Medicaid fraud, cruelty to the infirm, and obstruction of justice. Dean's attorney said Dean was informed earlier this week of the warrant against him. A Georgia resident, Dean flew to Louisiana and turned himself in yesterday, Wednesday. His lawyer, McClendon, said Dean was to be released on a $350,000 bond. Attorney General Jeff Landry said the criminal charges stem from allegations that Dean billed Medicaid for dates. His residents were not receiving proper care at the warehouse and engaged in conduct intended to intimidate or obstruct public health officials and law enforcement. McClendon said he could not comment on all the charges because he had not yet read the entire warrant. But he said during a brief interview, I don't think Bob Dean did anything that rose to the level of criminal. In the days after Ida hit, on August 29th, the state reported the deaths of seven people who had been evacuated to the warehouse in the town of Independence. Five were classified as storm-related deaths. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. Think of a top executive at a powerhouse company. You're no doubt imagining someone who's confident and clever, decisive and determined. And though it pains me to say it, you're probably picturing a man. The sad thing is, you wouldn't be too far off the mark. Around only 7% of S&P 500 CEOs are women, despite women making up 50% of the population. That's Asher Lawson, a graduate student at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. He says that one way to even the playing field might be to change the way we think about and talk about leadership. And he and his colleagues have found that organizations are more likely to describe women using words that are typically associated with achievement if they have female CEOs. Their findings appear in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Gender inequality has been deemed the greatest human rights challenge of our time by the United Nations. In our research, we're interested in specifically some of the factors that perpetuate these gender inequities, as well as the downstream consequences of those gender stereotypes. To get at the roots of these stereotypes, Lawson and his team took a closer look at corporate speak and the words businesses use when referring to women. So we're really interested in language because it gives us this deep insight into how people are thinking about women in a way that doesn't rely on them reporting it themselves. Now, coming straight out and asking companies how they feel about females can lead to some fanciful forecasting. So if you ask organizations whether they believe in gender equity or whether they're interested in fairness, because of social desirability concerns, they'll nearly always say yes. To find out if businesses talk the talk and walk the walk, 
the researchers parsed the shareholder reports and investor documents of S&P 500 companies. Using natural language processing techniques, they analyzed some 43,000 files, containing more than 1.2 billion words. And they looked for associations between words that signify women, like she and her, and words typically associated with leadership, like assertive or ambitious or effective. One way to think of it is if we had an autocomplete system like you use on your phone and you said she is, it would be like how likely is it that the next word is powerful? Once they assess the association. We then asked how do these associations change when you hire women as leaders? And we saw the same pattern across all of this data, that hiring women as senior leaders led to an increased association with those leadership congruent traits. And it wasn't that the companies were extolling the virtues of their own specific staff. So it's not just discussion of those new CEOs and board members, but actually generalizes to discussion of women more broadly. So we were heartened to see this result. At the same time, they wondered whether there might be any backlash. In other words, when a woman's seen as more competent, is she then considered to be less compassionate or considerate? Happily, we saw that there was no decreased association with being caring and these kinds of likable traits. Even better, the data suggests that the organizations that saw the biggest boost in female-linked leadership language are more likely to hire even more women. So this highlights the opportunity for a virtuous cycle where the effect can snowball. The appointing women leads women to be more closely associated with these traits that are seen as necessary to be leaders, and this can actually precipitate hiring more women in the future. So it's a very exciting process to witness. And something the head honcho will surely write about in her next annual report. For Scientific Americans, 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when it happened. There was a sudden jolt and our submarine crashed on the seafloor. We were in total darkness. That's Dr. Dejana Figuerella, a marine biologist and STEM teacher, talking about a deep sea dive she'll never forget. It's funny, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the ocean. And there I was, two miles below the surface. But as a scientist, you prepare for that. Using our training and a little creativity, we fixed the sub and finished our experiments. The dive was just too important. Every dive gives us glimpses at things few people ever get to see. Blowing creatures, fiery undersea volcanoes. When we got back to the surface, I kissed the ground and called my mom, of course. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that dive for anything. Dr. Figueroa uses her passion for STEM to discover new things and make the world a better place. She can STEM, so can you. Check out She Can STEM for more stories and inspiration. A message from the Ad Council. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Pools, water parks, and other recreational water venues are popular places to relax and stay cool, but they can be sources of serious illness. Since 2000, nearly 500 outbreaks have been reported at recreational water venues in the U.S., resulting in over 27,000 illnesses and eight deaths. Most were caused by parasites, bacteria, viruses, or certain chemicals in the water. Parents with young children who have diarrhea should not allow their children to swim or play in the water. In addition, bathers should check the inspection scores of pools and water parks and can conduct mini inspections using test strips before getting in the water. A few simple precautions can allow you to share the fun, not the germs. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution so donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Resistance Radio. 
right before our eyes, an invaluable American species is fast disappearing from view. Cartoonus Americanus. These are newspaper cartoonists who've long delighted readers and infuriated power elites. And there's nothing natural about their sudden decline. It's not the result of a dwindling talent pool and certainly not due to a lack of political targets. Rather, what's happening is that their media habitat is being intentionally destroyed. Around the start of the 20th century, some 2,000 newspapers featured their own full-time cartoonists. But in just the last decade, those healthy media environments have shriveled. So now, only a couple of dozen newspapers have these vibrant artistic journalists on staff. One major reason is that most U.S. papers have been gobbled up by profiteering hedge funds that have merged, purged, and plundered these essential local sources of news and democratic discourse. The overriding interest of these Wall Street owners is to cash out a paper's financial assets and haul off the booty to boost their personal wealth. Journalism and democracy be damned. Thus, they view cartoonists as a paycheck that can be easily diverted into their corporate pockets, dismissing the fact that enjoying good local cartoonists ranks as one of the top reasons people give for buying the paper. Note that this mass extermination is not old-school media censorship, but sleight-of-hand money censorship by the new monopolistic order of newspapering. Political cartoonists are still free to express any opinion they want, but the Wall Street system locks them out of their primary marketplace. Censorship is ugly, but eliminating paychecks? Well, that's just business. This is Jim Hightower saying, Yet, these freewheeling spirits of the cartooning craft are inventing new ways to connect with America's strong demand for their fun and important work. To connect with them, go to editorialcartoonist.com. Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. Local heroes faced threats. Listen up. This matters. I'm Lewis Black, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Local heroes faced threats was a recent headline for the Associated Press story about the, quote, chilling, tearful testimony from local election officials to the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol and the efforts to prevent Joe Biden from being sworn in as president. Those local officials in key battleground states testified about being leaned on to reject ballots and to submit alternate electors who would vote contrary to the results of the elections in their states. As one official put it, there were a lot of threats wishing death upon me. Congressman Benny Thompson, the chair of the January 6th committee, praised those local officials who stood for accuracy and honesty in the counting of ballots, characterizing them as the backbone of democracy. Chairman Thompson succinctly summarized the threat this way. A handful of election officials in key states stood between Donald Trump and the upending of democracy. Although the January 6th committee has not yet written its report, one conclusion already is clear. The United States has taken great pride in the strength of our democracy. And yet it turns out that our democracy actually is fragile. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil Liberties Union because freedom can't defend itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Chances are you've heard of black lung, the deadly disease that threatens coal miners. But have you ever heard of brown lung? On this day in labor history, the year was 1978. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, adopted standards to fight this workplace hazard. Brown lung is caused by breathing in cotton dust. Sometimes the condition was known as Monday fever. Workers in textile mills, especially mills with poor ventilation, are at risk from brown lung. Health officials first recognized the potential 
potential threat of brown lung in the 1930s. But it took almost half a century for comprehensive federal workplace safety standards to be implemented on this issue. At the time the new regulations were passed, it was estimated that 35,000 workers suffered from brown lung. This meant that 1 in 12 workers in the industry suffered from this agonizing disease with another 100,000 workers at risk. Symptoms of brown lung include coughing, wheezing, and difficulty breathing. Severe cases can result in heart failure and death. From 1974 until 1986, the not-for-profit group the Brown Lung Association organized around this workplace safety issue. The organization worked primarily in the Carolinas, but also did outreach in Virginia and Georgia. The Brown Lung Association held its first breathing clinic at a church in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1975. It went on to hold similar clinics in other southern cities. The group ran media and lobbying campaigns to bring attention to the issue. They also helped workers file compensation claims. Thanks to OSHA and groups like the Brown Lung Association, in the 1990s, the number of deaths attributed to brown lung had fallen to 81. According to OSHA, the instances of brown lung have fallen to 0.01 cases per 10,000 workers. The fight to end brown lung is just one part of the struggle to ensure workplace safety in the United States. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, because there's a lot more of us where we come from. And it is currently 62 degrees, expected to be a tad cooler than yesterday, but we'll see. Uh, we're only supposed to be in the upper 80s today, whereas we were in the mid to upper 90s yesterday. And we should be that way again tomorrow, we are supposedly uh, forecast as. And then uh, shoot up over the weekend to 100 to 104. How fun! How fun. And then maybe we'll get some a spate of cooler weather in the mere mid-80s. We'll see how that works out. Partly cloudy skies today with winds out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Clear skies overnight with lows in the mid-50s, which will be the case even when we have uh, exceedingly hot weather over the weekend. And uh, winds will be out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Sunny tomorrow with highs uh, 88 to 90. Winds out of the north at 5 to 10 miles per hour. We do have an update for confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon, which is the county with a capital T-H-E. That is remaining under, uh, they can't say mandatory anymore. Because everybody gets a gun. <laughs> everybody. Just letting you know. But uh, we're supposed to continue wearing masks indoors and outdoors. We now have confirmed cases uh, standing at 461,025. And we have increased the deceased total by one. And it stands at 549. I should once again remind folks that for the confirmed case total... We have a problem that is uh, around the nation. People are home testing, and when they test positive, they are not telling the health department. So these totals could be considerably higher than what they are listed. Grass pollen is the pollen that is rated very high right here in Rogue River proper, the air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is good and has only notched itself up to one notch and this hat 22 parts per million 
and the daytime UV index is very high at level 9. So you know to take care, cover up, and wear a hat, and slather on the SPF. Barometric pressure is holding steady currently at 30.04 inches. Visibility is at 7 miles, and relative humidity is at 88%. A little sticky again. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 75 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 83 degrees and sunny. Rome is 91 and fair. Kiev is 70 degrees and cloudy. Kabul is 68 and clear. Hong Kong is 84 and fair. Tokyo is 74 and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 54 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 58 and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 72 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Morris, Sammy Westfall, and Reese Thebold of the Washington Post brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Austria, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands announced plans this week to resurrect old coal plants as gas supplies dwindled. The moves came just days after Moscow reduced natural gas flows to several European countries, including Italy and Slovakia, alarming leaders who are worried about energy reserves ahead of winter. That's not the direction in which these governments wanted to move. A return to coal would controvert climate policy already in place in Amsterdam and Berlin, and some officials are concerned about the longer-term threats such a move would post to efforts to fight climate change in Europe. Germany says it is restarting some coal power plants while Austria is outfitting an existing plant to use coal. In the Netherlands, authorities have lifted production caps on coal-fired plants. Je te donne, c'est mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Restez Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Andrew Jiang, also of the Washington Post, brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Australia's Victoria State, home to Melbourne, passed legislation that bans the public display of Nazi symbols such as the swastika. It is the first jurisdiction in the country to enact restrictions on the swastika, which has been appropriated by far-right extremists. Appropriated? The law comes as Australia faces a spike in ideological extremism. A top federal police official told a public broadcaster in October that the number of far-right linked terrorism investigations has increased by 750% in about 18 months, even though religious extremism was still a larger threat. And we know what that means. The Australian Security Intelligence Organization, 
a domestic security agency, said in 2019 that about a third of its counterterrorism investigations involved right-wing extremism. That year, an Australian gunman killed 51 people at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. The law, which takes effect in six months, carries punitive measures that may include a prison sentence of up to 12 months, a fine of up to roughly $15,000 or both. State lawmakers held a hearing last week in which experts largely agreed on the need to deter extremism, though rights groups such as Liberty Victoria cautioned that the law should not undermine free speech. Well, we'll see. And that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver